Live from WRAL News Headquarters in Raleigh, your number one source for local news. WRAL News, coverage you can count on. Our next system is taking shape back to the west. I'll show you what time this arrives here and how it could affect your weekend plans. Durham leaders are examining ways to prevent crimes committed by young people. We'll take a look at some of the programs under consideration. Plus, the growing illegal migrant crisis takes center stage today. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump both head to the southern border for a first-hand look at the problem. We are getting a break from the rain today, but more is on the way tomorrow. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Renee Chu. And I'm Jeff Hogan. Thanks for joining us. Meteorologist Elizabeth Gardner is in the WRL Severe Weather Center with a look at how early to expect that rain where you are. All day today, we've been watching the new runs of the computer models coming in, and the rain is arriving earlier and earlier and moving out earlier, too. And that may be good news if you have plans to be outside on Saturday. For Friday morning, expect it to be dry early, but we'll start to see some rain pushing in by lunchtime, if not before in parts of the viewing area. It is going to be a cold start, but it looks like temperatures will be above freezing by the time the rain arrives. We'll see scattered showers through the afternoon, cloud cover, of course, and then some heavier rain late afternoon and overnight. And then it looks like it moves out fairly quickly Saturday. Let's follow along on Futurecast by 11 o'clock uh, tomorrow morning. We may already see some showers. It's not likely to be an issue for the morning commute, but by lunchtime, that rain is spreading across the region. That's 12. We'll pause it at 5 o'clock. It's likely to be a messy commute for Friday evening, and then we're still wet during dinner time and through the evening. As a matter of fact, steady rain almost all night. We take it out to 6 a.m. on Saturday, and the rain's starting to pull out. We'll pause it here at 8 o'clock, and it's pretty much out of the viewing area. Um, a couple of the other computer models are on board with uh, this timeline, so we're feeling pretty confident about that. That leaves Saturday mainly cloudy but dry for much of the day. Uh, temperatures will be on the mild side, so a 50% chance on Friday. It's a 100% chance really afternoon and overnight, and then we start to see that rain tapering off. Coming up, we'll talk about how much rain we'll see and what we'll see Sunday as well. New this new dramatic video of a police pursuit caught on tape in Wake County. A 21 year old woman is in custody today in connection with that chase. WRL's Ken Smith is here with a look at the video. Wake County Sheriff's Office released just a short time ago. Ken. I'll tell you, Jeff, this video looks like a scene out of a movie, but this was a very serious situation that unfolded Wednesday afternoon. Take a look at the video. WRL viewer emailed to us. You can see how this all ended after the driver took the Hammond Road exit off I-40 West. Law enforcement officers surrounding that car with guns drawn. It appears the driver, 21-year-old Mary Catherine Land, surrendered without incident. This all started when a Wake County deputy he spotted land speeding on I-40 West near Poole Road. Land is now facing charges that include speeding to elude arrest, reckless driving, and felony possession of a controlled substance. Land also has outstanding warrants on similar charges in Morrisville. I've reached out to Morrisville PD for more information about that. Look for updates on this story online and, of course, starting in our news at 4. A wild ending there. Mm -hmm. Ken, thanks for that. Kids under 10 committing crimes. New numbers show juvenile crime jumped 49% in Durham last year. WRL's Monica Casey shows us how community groups are getting involved to reverse this trend. And Monica, what's the current picture there? Yeah, Renee, that latest crime report shows the most common juvenile offenses are larceny, stolen property, and weapons offenses. Some of those offenses were committed by children as young as eight and nine years old. Last year also saw juveniles facing consequences for serious and violent crimes, including six homicides and 14 aggravated assaults. Counties across the state have individual juvenile crime prevention councils, including Durham. Today, that council held a funding information information session for groups who are interested in getting involved. Leaders emphasize this is a unique state and local partnership where the local councils get to decide what their specific county needs are. The programs chosen to receive funding should address risk factors and provide either treatment, rehab, or academic help to minors in need. They would go into effect and start receiving the funding. July 1st. Right now they have about $71,000 from the state to distribute. Renee? It's a united front to tackle this problem. Monica Casey, live in Durham. 
Fayetteville saw a 10% drop in crime during last year compared to 2022. That's a continuation of a seven-year trend in total crimes across the city, with the exception of homicides. Police also increased traffic stops by 53%. Now to the war in the Middle East, where at least 70 people were killed and many others injured today as crowds rushed to aid trucks in Gaza as they entered that area. Israeli government officials confirm Israeli troops used live fire, but they're saying the crowd posed a threat to Israeli soldiers. It's not clear what that threat could have been. The Israeli military is saying some of the casualties may have been caused by trampling in the crowd. Russian President Vladimir Putin is warning NATO countries that they risk nuclear conflict if they send troops to Ukraine. The warning comes after France hinted at the possibility. The United States and key European allies this week said they had no plans to send ground troops to Ukraine. And happening right now in the WRL Live Center, a court in Siberia has denied the appeal of former ballerina Ksenia Karolina. She is a dual Russian-American citizen. She had been detained on suspicion of raising money for Ukraine's armed forces. She donated $50 last year. Uh, She was appealing her detention on charges of treason. The treason charge carries up to 20 years in prison in Russia. Her lawyer had asked the court to lift her detention and replace it with house arrest. Now, supporters are saying that Russia is using her to exert leverage on Washington, while Russia says authorities are just simply following the law. The border and the migrant crisis take center stage in Texas today as the top contenders for the White House head to the southern border. President Biden visits the border in Brownsville, some 300 miles to the northwest of Eagle Pass. Former President Donald Trump will do the same. Both men are taking a closer look at the situation while trying to convince voters they have answers for the problems there. NBC's Jay Gray reports from Brownsville, Texas. Well, in his second trip to the southern border since taking office, President Biden will be here in Brownsville, the White House, saying that he'll meet with local leaders as well as Border Patrol agents. He's also trying to ramp up some pressure on congressional Republicans to take action on a bipartisan uh, border security measure that's really been a political football in Washington, passed back and forth in Congress and the White House involved as well. So he's going to try and push uh, for that, while former President President Trump will be just up the Rio Grande and Eagle Pass. Uh, the border continues to be a primary issue as a part of his campaign to retake the White House. Overnight, he released a campaign video on social media uh, linking uh, recent murder of Georgia nursing student Lakin Riley to what he calls uh, the administration's, quote, open border policies, both uh, expected to lay out what they think is needed to help the crisis here, to help the problems that really have been escalating over the last several years. And of course, both also expected to push back and forth between one another. And I think it's no coincidence that all of this comes uh, less than a week away from the Super Tuesday primaries here in Texas and across the country. That's the latest from Brownsville. I'm Jay Gray. Now back to you. In less than 30 minutes before our newscast, a judge blocked a Texas law that would allow police to arrest migrants who illegally enter the U.S. Today's another milestone day in North Carolina's effort to legalize mobile sports betting in the state. Tomorrow will be another one. WRL investigative sports reporter Brian Murphy joins us now with an update on this process, Brian. Yeah, we're expecting to find out this afternoon which sports betting operators will be allowed to accept bets in North Carolina on March 11th. We're expecting as many as eight operators to be awarded licenses by the Lottery Commission. And tomorrow, customers will be allowed to sign up with those betting sites and begin to put their money into those accounts. So what they call those operators right there, uh, the gambling sites you've probably heard of. Everybody's heard of them all over media. For example, FanDuel, DraftKings, Caesars, BetMGM, ESPN Bet. Sounds like a lot. Uh, but what was the process to get a license? Well, in order to apply, each operator had to sign an agreement with one of 13 current entities in North Carolina. We're talking the Hurricanes 
Hornets, uh, the Hornets, um, you know, golf courses, PGA Tour, NASCAR. And the application fee for each license is one million dollars. Um, there you go. You see the facilities there on on your on your screen. Um, they all had the the Carolina Hurricanes, for example, signed with Fanatics. Uh, there are still more. Um, the agreements won't impact which apps you can use. They'll all be statewide. Okay. And uh, we might not be done with it either. Down the road, there could be even more of these operators in the state. Yeah, there are. We, we talked about only eight operators today. Well, there are 13 entities where uh, these apps can sign with. And if North Carolina ever gets a Major League Baseball team, that would add a 14. <laughs> There's a lot going on. We look forward to the days to come. I know you have another uh, meet with us tomorrow. <laughs> thank all you. All right. Thank you. Brian and Tim Donnelly from 99.9 .9 The Fan explore the history of sports betting in North Carolina. What did it take to get to this point and how will it change sports and sports fans going forward? Season three of A Brief History of Triangle Sports will be available March 11th on all podcast apps. Next at noon, the number of wheelchairs that get damaged by airlines might surprise you. The plan to make airlines pay and how much? Also, wildfires in Texas have turned deadly. How a weather change, though, might help those fighting the flames. Plus, already approved for renovations. The design meeting happening today for PNC Arena's makeover. Keep watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257. The Department of Justice is looking into the door plug blowout on a Boeing 737 MAX 9 jet last month. This is the second time the DOJ has investigated the company. Now the investigation will determine if Boeing violated its deferred prosecution agreement. An agreement reached following two deadly crashes in 2018 and 2019. If it's determined the blowout breaches that agreement, Boeing could face criminal liability. The FAA is giving Boeing 90 days to come up with a plan to fix quality problems and improve safety. The government says airlines damage or lose about 11,000 passenger wheelchairs every year. The D Department of Transportation is proposing steep fines for airlines that damage passenger wheelchairs. Passengers would immediately be notified when something happens to their wheelchair, be given a loaner, and get to choose how their chair is repaired. The plan calls for airlines to pay up to $124,000 and to require enhanced employee training. Denver police have recovered pieces that were stolen from a monument of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. earlier this month. Police say there were three pieces. One of them was a large bronze plaque. Investigators say they're looking for two people and have so far only identified one of them. The creator of the monument says the pieces can be repaired but could take months. More than $10,000 has been raised to help pay for the work and for more security around that memorial. The FDA says certain types of forever chemicals will no longer be used in U.S. food packaging. The agency says materials like fast food wrappers, microwave popcorn bags, and pizza boxes were a major source of exposure to certain types of PFAS and the hormone disturbing chemical has been linked to a variety of health effects, including certain cancers. The FDA estimates it could take another 18 months after the products containing the substances are phased out. At least one person is dead and homes and livelihoods destroyed by the largest wildfire in Texas history. The Smokehouse Creek Fire has torched nearly a million acres. That's larger than the state of Rhode Island. Casey Stegall reports from Texas where a change in wind could help firefighters contain the flames. A disaster declaration is now in effect for 60 counties in Texas as the wildfires here continue to spread. Hundreds of firefighters are now fighting multiple blazes, including the Smokehouse Creek Fire. At least one person is confirmed dead, while dozens of others are now homeless after watching their communities burn. I think everyone's still really in shock. I mean, literally the entire... Everything around the town is completely ash. But firefighters could be getting some help from Mother Nature on Thursday. The fast spread has been fueled by strong winds, dry grass, and unseasonably warm temperatures. But now meteorologists are forecasting a change in wind patterns and cooler temperatures, which would help increase containment. We're 
with our current conditions, um, the spread is going to be minimalized, especially with not much winds pushing them. So that is going to be helpful. Meanwhile, the White House says President Biden is monitoring the situation closely and Texas will have all the resources it needs to contain the fires. Federal officials are in close contact with state and local officials on the front lines of these fires. And FEMA and the U.S. Forest Service are providing assistance to, to the state. That was Casey Stegall reporting. The National Weather Service says those improved weather conditions will not last. Another big warm up is expected this weekend. They'll get up into the 70s and then, of course, the winds will continue to be a challenge oh, there. They need all the help they can get mm -hmm. with the wind shifting directions. This one, we had a change in direction with the wind as well. That southerly flow, the cool warm air. air. <laughs> yeah, now it's cool air. Elizabeth Gardner in the WRN Severe mm -hmm. Weather Center. Yeah, and it's interesting because people you know, think, wait a minute, why? Why was it warm and then it was cold and that's crazy? It's very normal for this time of year for us to see big swings in temperature. We're uh, making that switch now from cold temperatures in the winter to warm temperatures um, in the summer. And we have cold fronts that start to help to, us to change those temperatures. And uh, they'll, you know, ahead of the front, we warm up and behind it, we cool down. And that's exactly what happened. A real warm day yesterday and a cool day today. This is a live look at Sanford. We have a little bit of lingering cloud cover out there, but a good bit of sunshine. 49 is our temperature. Our dew point's 18, so a nice dry air mass in place. Our highs will be in the low 50s this afternoon, which is going to be about five or so degrees cooler than normal. We're still in the, in the 40s in a lot of places. 47 Southern Pines, 48 Goldsboro, 50 in Rocky Mount, 43 in Roxboro, 50 in Fayetteville and in Clinton. A 24 hour temperature change anywhere from about 15 to 20 degrees colder than it was this time yesterday. But we were anticipating that happening. Yesterday's high was 72 and we're looking at a high today of around 53. So definitely a big, big change, but something that's not terribly unusual for late winter into early spring. And I said, well, we've got another three weeks until spring starts. Actually, tomorrow is the first day of meteorological spring. We look at how the weather behaves versus how the sun affects our calendar. And we, you know, it, we start to see spring like changes you know, starting early March, of course. Uh, Raleigh today, 53, 52 in Durham, 55 in Fayetteville for our high temperature this afternoon. Of course, we have cool air that has filtered in behind yesterday's front. We were talking about all that warmth and the, and the wildfires. We're going to see a lot of that warmth across our uh, viewing area as well. Starting over the weekend, we warm back into the 60s and we'll have some days in the 70s for next week. It doesn't look like we'll see high fire danger, probably because we do have some chances of rain uh, again on Friday and possibly again around the middle of next week. Our normal high for today is 59, but that begins to creep on up into the 60s as we get into the month of March. Today, 53. Tomorrow, 54. And then 65 on Saturday. Tomorrow is likely to be a fairly wet day. It's early is lunchtime continuing on and off for the rest of the day and so it's going to be a chilly wet day not a not a great day to be outside saturday though we'll see 65 and sunday 68 and i feel like the bulk of the weekend will be variably cloudy but fairly mild we take a look at our chance of rain on friday we talked about the fact that uh, the newer runs of the computer models are bringing that in earlier so we could see rain across the viewing area by lunchtime on friday and that chance just goes up as we get into the late afternoon and looking at a high chance overnight where it may be somewhat heavy at times. It looks like it'll pull out by Saturday morning, but I'll walk you through Saturday morning again coming up in just a while. Sunday looks mostly cloudy but dry at 68. And then uh, Monday and Tuesday, if we had a little sunshine, wouldn't uh, be bad at all. Temperatures will be mild in the low 70s. And then our next best chance of rain comes in on Wednesday. I'll show you how much rain we may see Friday and Saturday. We'll take a look at the drought monitor, which had started to slip back into abnormally dry conditions in some places coming up in just a few minutes. Don't like the weather? Just wait a few days and it'll change. Elizabeth, thanks. Coming up on WRL News at 530, UNC police and students are teaming up for a program that enhances nighttime safety on campus. We'll explain how it works. Also tonight at 6, some Durham seniors are suing an apartment building's owner over living conditions. How Duke Law students are now getting involved. And still ahead this noon, Chick-fil-A is recalling some packages of Polynesian sauce. The allergens you should look out for. That's after the break. And your favorite sports drink might not be as healthy as you think. Coming up, a better way to get your dose of electrolytes. The world's largest brewer lost more than a billion dollars in sales because of the Bud Light boycott. Anheuser-Busch reported record revenues for 2023, but said its U.S. business was hurt by the backlash from its brief partnership with a transgender influencer. 
Revenue in North America plunged $1.4 billion last April following a sponsored Instagram post with Dylan Mulvaney. The company says it has seen gradual improvement in sales since May. If you have a burning legal question, tomorrow's the day to get free answers. Five on your side's Lawyers on Call connects you with North Carolina licensed attorneys for free. Get your questions answered anonymously and let a professional connect you with additional resources that can help you figure out just about any legal issue. Lawyers on Call is tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. It's tax season, and this year people are choosing to save rather than pay down debt with their refund. Despite reports of more debt, emergency savings are taking priority over lowering credit card debt. This comes as a shock considering that 36% of Americans report having more credit card debt than emergency savings. Generational differences and concerns about financial stability are major contributors to the change. Burger King is capitalizing on the backlash over Wendy's possible price surge. It's offering a free Whopper through tomorrow as long as you spend $3. Now, earlier this week, Wendy's CEO announced that the chain was testing out dynamic pricing. The phrase caught the attention of people and politicians who then accused the chain of price gouging. Wendy's now says the chain will not raise prices during busy times. Instead, it says digital menus could allow it to change items during the day and offer discounts during slower times. Fans of Chick-fil-A, you want to hear this. The fast food restaurant is asking customers to throw away some Polynesian sauces because they contain allergens and are an entirely different sauce. If you took home any Polynesian sauce from the restaurant between February 14th, Valentine's Day, and this Tuesday... Be aware, they may, be, they may contain wheat or soy in them. Now, some Walmart customers may qualify for part of a $45 million settlement. The class action lawsuit claims the retailer inflated product weight, mislabeled bagged produce weight, and overcharged for clearance items. Customers who bought eligible sold-by-weight groceries from Walmart between October 19th of 2018 and January 19th of this year qualify for the settlement. To find out if you qualify, you can go to walmartweightedgrocerysettlement.com. Today, we're expected to learn which firm will lead the renovations at PNC Arena. We're live at the meeting where the list of contenders is dwindling. The U.S. Supreme Court will decide former President Donald Trump's immunity claim in the Georgia election case. And here are the winning lottery numbers. Shot in 4K ultra high definition. Your number one source for local news. WRAL News. Coverage you can count on. Welcome back. The group that owns PNC Arena is wrapping up a series of interviews for the next potential design team for its scheduled renovations. The Centennial Authority Board listened as different companies made their pitch for the opportunity to take on the $300 million project. WRL's Destiny Patterson is live at PNC Arena with the results. Destiny. Well, Jeff, this meeting has been going on for well over three hours at this point. I just stepped out and they're discussing which out of the three design teams that they heard from this morning would be the best fit for this $300 million project. Now, this all comes after PNC and the Centennial Authority Board cut ties with its design team back in January. Each design firm that came in this morning, they were flexing their previous projects and experience, many of them from other cities as well as how they plan to incorporate newer trends like sports betting into the new facility. The Building and Construction Committee asked questions about these firms, about how they can stay on budget and on time, as well as the locality of these firms. Are they based in the Raleigh area? Have they done projects nearby? The committee says it's looking for that wow factor to keep the fan experience for not only sports, but all entertainment. I think one of the things that we really feel strongly about is that fan experience. We want this place to be rocking, and we want it to be rocking for sporting events. We want it to be rocking for events like we just have at uh, Bocelli here, and we want this community to appreciate and be proud of the venue that they have. 
Pierre says that the goal at the end of today's meeting will be to select the new design team and renovations are set to begin in the summer of 2025. Still talking about it. That's where it stands now. Destiny, thanks for the update. The U.S. Supreme Court now playing to hear Trump's presidential immunity claim. The federal election interference case is one of several criminal and civil cases the former president currently faces. NBC's Laura Jarrett reports. This morning, the U.S. Supreme Court handing Donald Trump the gift of time. The justices agreeing to decide whether the Republican frontrunner should be immune from federal charges because his attempts to reverse the 2020 election happened while he was still in office. We will never give up. We will never concede. In a one-page order, the high court saying it will hear arguments in the case the week of April 22nd. But with no firm date for its final ruling, the prospect of a federal criminal trial being completed before the November election becoming increasingly unrealistic. And if the Supreme Court rules in Mr. Trump's favor, the charges against him in Washington, D.C., wiped out completely. You cannot allow a president to be out there without immunity. They don't have immunity. You don't have a presidency. The stakes sky high for the former president who has cast the prosecution itself as election interference and special counsel Jack Smith's team, which has accused Mr. Trump of defrauding the government he once led. My office will seek a speedy trial so that our evidence can be tested in court. But the case has been beset by appeals on the immunity question, with lower courts finding Mr. Trump should not be shielded from prosecution. The Trump campaign seizing on the Supreme Court taking up the case as another fundraising opportunity, with the former president pressing his case on social media. This as the high court is set to rule on another issue with major implications for the future of the presidential race. The justices currently weighing Colorado's move to ban Mr. Trump from the ballot. Voters there set to go to the polls next week on Super Tuesday. And late Wednesday, Illinois became the third state to find the former president ineligible to serve under the Constitution's insurrection clause in the 14th Amendment in light of his role on January 6. That was Laura Jarrett reporting. Former Trump White House advisor Mark Meadows lost his bid to have his election interference case moved to federal court. The former U.S. representative from North Carolina says he should have federal immunity due to his role in the Trump administration. Meadows has been charged with violating Georgia's racketeering law, and he's also accused of trying to get Georgia's secretary of state to violate his oath of office during the 2020 election. Meadows has pleaded not guilty. Many students at St. Augustine's University are considering transferring after the school lost its accreditation. One student told WRAL anyone who isn't currently a senior is seriously looking into transferring. Degrees from an unaccredited university do not hold the same weight as one from an accredited school. Also, students will not be able to get federal financial aid to continue to attend St. Aug. Other colleges often welcome students affected by accreditation loss. Wake Tech has already seen interest from current St. Aug students. I don't think transferring is going to be difficult for them. It's just going to be that whole college search process again. Um, and, and that's stressful. Students can also choose to stick around in hopes St. Aug will turn things around and regain accreditation before their graduation date. The university plans to file a lawsuit that will allow it to maintain accreditation while the case plays out in court. A Durham teacher is helping students who missed out on what should have been their first high school experience make up for lost time. We all remember how the COVID-19 pandemic forced students in 2020 to learn at home online. That included freshmen who were just entering high school. Students who are now seniors at Hillside High School have had a community of support ever since. English teacher Jahara Davis calls it Village University, and it has helped those students grow. It's her classroom culture and it's it's the bond that we create amongst each other. It makes it it makes us feel like family. We connect on a level that's beyond surface. So we get each other. We understand each other. We build uh, create bonds with each other. Davis's creative approach helped more than 45 of her students exceed growth for both the school and the district. It earned her Durham Public Schools Teacher of the Year Award. Now she's taking the students to Washington, D.C. as a reward. Still to come, another reason to go see a concert. The new research explaining how live music is good for the brain. 
Plus, new guidance on COVID boosters. Experts tell us why seniors should make it a priority, even if they just got one in the fall. Remember, you can watch WRL News live anytime on WRL.com or the WRL app on your streaming device. A live look right now downtown Raleigh as you watch WRL News available on Spectrum and the WRL app on your TV or streaming device. Sports drinks with electrolytes might not be as healthy as you think. Common electrolytes found in sports drinks include sodium, potassium, and calcium, which can improve the brain, heart, and nerves. But some of those drinks can include lots of sugar and food dye. So instead of grabbing a sports drink, consumers can supplement by adding a powdered version of electrolytes to water. Live music stimulates the brain more than a recorded track. A recent study found live music triggers a higher emotional response and imagination. Researchers say live music stimulation of the brain shows a strong emotional processing in the affective and cognitive parts of the brain. The study could not pinpoint if the venue made a difference. Good news for renters in Raleigh. New numbers show the price of rent is finally headed down after skyrocketing since the pandemic. A large number of new apartments has made finding one easier, cooling the prices a bit. But the average rent for a one-bedroom place is still between $1,300 and $1,500 a month. Remote workers who live in Raleigh or Cary, you're in one of the best places in the country to work from home. A new study ranks Boulder, Colorado as number one, followed by the Raleigh-Cary metro area. The study lumped Durham and Chapel Hill together and ranked it ninth. It looked at housing costs, percentage of remote workers, internet access, and commute times. The study found just almost 17% of people in Raleigh and Cary work remote, which is well above the national average. Where the area lost points was in the higher housing costs. CDC is once again recommending COVID boosters. Coming up, we'll explain which age group should make an appointment for the shot. And just four days after a court storming injury, Flip was back in action with the Duke Blue Devils in a big way. Stay with us. Welcome back as we take a live look at Durham at the American Tobacco Campus. Pretty view there with the sunshine and the clouds. Not as warm today with that cooler air there. are highs only in the 50s. Americans 65 and older are now being encouraged to get a second COVID-19 booster dose. That recommendation coming from the CDC and even applies to seniors who already got an updated shot in the fall. Matt Finn has a closer look at the new guidance. <laughs> Over time, uh, uh, immunity drops in all individuals. Concerns over vaccine trigger defenses fading over time, prompting a CDC advisory panel to recommend seniors 65 and older get a second COVID-19 booster shot. This new spring dose would be the same shot given last year, targeting the original COVID variant and newer subvariants. Older individuals are at higher risk of morbidity and mortality or more severe consequences of COVID. While signing off on the advice, CDC Director Dr. Mandy Cohen noted most COVID-19 deaths and hospitalizations last year were among seniors. Cohen writing in a statement, quote, an additional vaccine dose can provide added protection that may have decreased over time for those at highest risk. The decision comes after a lengthy debate by an advisory panel well aware most Americans have not listened to previous recommendations. According to CDC, CDC data, an estimated 22% of U.S. adults have gotten an updated COVID vaccine booster. That number goes up to nearly 42% in the 65 and older bracket. There is definitely an element in America of vaccine fatigue. They just feel like uh, they've had a lot of vaccines and they're, they're sort of getting tired of the process. That was Matt Finn reporting, and this new booster can be given to seniors four months after getting the first one. Duke basketball star Kyle Filipowski is back on the court. He played in last night's game against Louisville just days after a collision with fans storming the court after Wake Forest beat the Blue Devils. There was some confusion as to how severe Kyle Filipowski's injur injury was. Coach John Shire admitted that he misspoke when he called it an ankle, ankle injury. It was a knee injury. Filipowski was in the starting lineup for Duke. He ended up finishing the game with nine points and ten rebounds. Duke beat Louisville 84-59. to 
College basketball sensation Caitlin Clark just set two new records. Clark scored 33 points in the Iowa Hawkeyes win last night against Minnesota. And that eliminates an asterisk in her status as women's college basketball's all-time leading scorer. She's now ahead of Lynette Woodard of Kansas, who set the record before the NCAA officially sanctioned women's basketball. Clark is now just 18 points away from setting the all-time record for scoring among men and women. Clark also hit her 155th three-pointer of the season. That's a new single-season record. She just keeps draining those threes. She is going to be She's the number so one pick in the WNBA draft if she chooses because she has another year of eligibility, if you can believe that. She can come back and shatter records. She has such a skill set and such yeah. a social media darling and really inspiring so many yeah. young athletes. It is really cool to see. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth Gardner over in the WRM Severe Weather Center. We're going to get through this cold here and ride this roller coaster. I, it's, a, it's a good day to get outside and play some basketball. we got lots of uh, sunshine if you're inspired by that. What amazing shooting ability. That was, that was great to watch. Uh, beautiful out there. I mean, there's some high, thin cloud cover, and it is on the cool side, but we've got a lot of blue sky out here in Goldsboro. I'm uh, taking a look actually at Raleigh here, uh, Chapel Hill, courtesy of Top of the Hill Restaurant and Apex, all looking nice and quiet. We have a big area of high pressure that is spinning right about here. You can almost watch the wind streams spinning in a clockwise fashion. So we are seeing some of that colder air that's spilling in for today and tomorrow. But we'll see our next system approaching. It's starting to pick up some steam back here to the west. It slides eastward and actually becomes eventually a low pressure system that'll be moving up the coast. And that's what's going to help to bring us some rain tomorrow night and uh, into Saturday. We'll start to see some of that rain maybe by lunchtime tomorrow. We'll start dry during the morning commute, but then after that, we'll begin to see some showers developing. It's going to be another cold start in the morning, upper 30s as you're heading out the door. Um, Scattered rain in the afternoon with uh, plenty of clouds. And then uh, during the late afternoon and overnight, we'll see some of that heavier rain. But it looks like it'll pull out fairly early on Saturday. If you have outdoor plans, it it looks pretty good. Uh, In the morning tomorrow, we're likely to start to see that rain between 10 and 11 o'clock. Again, it should not... We shouldn't have to deal with it during the morning commute. But mid-morning, it rolls on in. We're seeing some rain around lunchtime. It moves all the way across the viewing area by about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, making for a wet evening commute. That's our 5 o'clock view there. And 8 o'clock, it's just going to rain pretty much all evening and all night. We'll pause it here at 6 a.m. And this is where we're starting to see the back edge of the rain, and that pulls off to the east. Now, the timeline for this is a little earlier than what we were looking at yesterday. But we've had about three consistent runs of the computer models that show this earlier departure of the rain on Saturday. And it's not just this version of Futurecast, another version of Futurecast also showing that early departure. So a couple days ago, it looked like we may have rain for the first half of Saturday. It is looking drier and drier. Here's a look at lunchtime on Saturday. We might see a few thin spots in the clouds, but we'll, we'll call it mostly cloudy for the afternoon. How much rainfall will we see? Likely Friday into the early part of Saturday, somewhere around a half an inch and an inch. So it's going to be you know pretty steady to heavy at times overnight. Could be a stray rumble of thunder, but we're not looking at a lot of thunderstorms. 70% uh, on Friday, at least the first half of the day, and then it's going to bump up uh, overnight to about 100%. And then again, we see that moving out pretty early on Saturday. Last week, we saw some of our eastern counties go back under abnormally dry conditions. We've seen things worsen a bit when the drought monitor came out this week. More of our southern counties are now abnormally dry, and just a few of our counties, Edgecombe County, Halifax County, just a little bit of those are now under moderate drought. And so that's the first time we've seen the moderate drought in about a month or so. Taking a look at pollen, the trees yesterday were looking moderate. That's the last reading that we had. Most likely we'll start to see that easing up a little bit the next few days with some cooler temperatures and that chance for rain. But most likely the pollen counts will start to go up again around Sunday. Mostly cloudy, 68, and we're in the 70s for early next week. Hey, February 29th is Leap Day, and while these twins are not babies, they're turning one, and we'll wish a very happy birthday to Langston and Grayson just ahead. And here's a look at the winning Powerball numbers. No one hit the jackpot last night, so the estimated jackpot for the next drawing, Saturday night, is now $443 million. We wrap things up with a look at a few of the headlines we're following for you today. A woman is in custody in connection with this Wake County chase. It started yesterday afternoon when a deputy spotted a car speeding on I-40 West near Poole Road. Police say the driver eventually took the Hammond Road exit. Officers surrounded that car with guns drawn and the driver surrendered. 
Durham's Juvenile Crime Prevention Council is asking for community proposals to address the problem of crime among kids and teens. The council held an information session this morning for groups who want to get involved. New numbers show juvenile crime jumped 49% in Durham last year. We should find out this afternoon which sports betting operators can accept bets in North Carolina on March 11th. As many as eight operators could get licenses from the Lottery Commission. The application fee is a million dollars. An operator will get that money back if the license is denied. Tomorrow, customers will be able to sign up with those betting sites and begin putting money in their accounts. People are throwing away the itineraries for more low-key vacations. A recent Longwoods International survey found 21% of travelers say rest and relaxation is the purpose for their getaway. And that's a change from having fun and family time to fully recharge new data from Hyatt's Apple Leisure Group shows an 11% increase in all-inclusive vacation bookings. Florida now tops the list for most popular spring break destinations. A new AAA survey shows many travelers are heading to the Sunshine State for the beaches, family-friendly attractions, and cruises. They say Orlando is spring breakers' top city, while Fort Lauderdale and Miami have the most popular cruise ports. If you're planning to head to Wrightsville Beach anytime soon, it is time to pay. Parking season starts this weekend. Parking rates and hours vary, so you want to double check the cost. There's a quick cheat to get two hours free. You have to register your car into the parking system, either at a pay-by-plate kiosk or text to park. You can find details on the town's website. A very special birthday mention on this leap day. These twins, Langston and Grayson, are celebrating their first birthday and they're four years old. <laughs> the pair was born on Leap Day 2020, so now four years later, they're finally getting a true birthday. Langston and Grayson like playing with toy cars. They are fans of WRL newscasts. We appreciate them. And they say Mike Mays' weather forecasts have a special place in their hearts. We'll tell them. Yeah. I think their birthday celebration should be at least four days if it comes every four Agreed. years. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday. Our pet of the day is looking for a loving family to share his golden years. Winston here is a sweet senior with a lot of love to give. He's an experienced, wise gentleman with 10 years of experience being a wonderful family pet. As you can see, Winston only has one eye. And for the most part, he follows his nose to get around. Winston is easygoing, friendly, loves to alternate between being by your side and then going off to do his own thing. For more information, visit spcawake.org. The nose knows. I'm sure he gets around fine. Mm -hmm. Coming up on WRL News at 4 p.m., Fayetteville crime dropped 10% last year, but the city saw a record number of homicides. Why the crime report's message is mixed. Nice to get a break from the rain today, but you got to grab your jacket. It's a little chilly out there. Yeah. NBC News Daily is next on WRAL, your next local news update in 30 minutes. You can also get breaking news updates anytime with the WRAL News app. Do grab that jacket. Enjoy the sunshine. Though. Have a great day. Keep watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1250.